next up, uh, we have uh, a, a talk on OCD in the media by Rose Cartwright and Sean Fletcher. Uh, Rose has written extensively on, on mental health and her own issues with OCD, uh, most notably in a book called Pure, which was then adapted into a television series of, of critical acclaim. Uh, Sean, uh, his life was turned upside down when his son Ruben was diagnosed uh, a couple of years ago, uh, and, and that harrowing experience led him to produce uh, a fantastic uh, panorama program on our cash-strapped uh, child and adolescent mental health service. Uh, and I'd like to bring them up to the stage now to talk about that. Thank you. So, uh, a great introduction, thank you. I, just to explain a little bit more, I, I will talk about media because I, I've worked in media since the late 90s and I'm a little bit out of breath after coming down those steps, actually. Um, and uh, I, I have noticed a change. Uh, uh, when I started in media, I knew nothing about OCD, very little about mental health. Um, but let me just tell you a little bit about myself. I have got a video that I actually sent to the organisers earlier today, and you will be able to play it in a moment. So I'm, I'm Sean Fletcher, I'm a broadcaster. I broadcast on a number of programmes across the BBC and ITV, um, programmes like Country File, um, Good Morning Britain, completely different programmes. I feel like a, a jack of all trades, master of none. Um, but other programmes like Songs of Praise and Sunday Morning Live. Um, and I'm also a father of a boy with OCD, as was previously explained. Um, I have a daughter who's 21 who has not shown any signs of, of mental illness at all, and my son who has really struggled with OCD uh, to the extent that it was debilitating in, in the same way that a physical disability would be, that he was unable to get out of bed, he was unable to go to school for a year, um, and simple things like cleaning his teeth, getting dressed, he was unable to do. Um, he's not here today, but we, as was explained, we made a panorama about the child and adolescent mental health services, and there's a little clip from him, so it'd be quite good just so you, when I'm talking about him, uh, you can visualise who he is and hear from the horse's mouth. So if we play this clip now. Can you tell me what OCD was like when it was at its worst? I might be worried that I'm going to do something really bad, like I'm going to accidentally kill you. It's like it starts to develop into, oh my gosh, I thought I was going to, I had a, I had the thought that I was worried I was going to kill you, so then surely that means I want to act upon that. And did, and did you have that thought about me? Yeah. I, was, I felt I was such a bad person for having that thought that to punish myself, I stayed in bed and wouldn't let myself move. Just try one step this time. My wife and I were very worried about Ruben. But we found it hard to show medical staff just how bad things were, so we decided to video him in the midst of an episode. On this occasion, he wouldn't allow himself to walk upstairs and was self-harming. Come on, I'll walk up with you. Come on, let's walk up together. You're really hitting yourself, aren't you? This happened every day. And you got the stairs. In this video, you can also see the cuts on the back of his neck where he was pinching himself, often breaking the skin. Everyday actions like getting out of bed, brushing his teeth, eating, all became huge obstacles. It took nine months to get the right help. During that time, our son was getting worse. Ruben really needed a specialist type of therapy which aims to change thought patterns. Had he broken a leg, we would have got care immediately. So, that, so that's Ruben uh, and the panorama focused on a different thing that I won't be talking about today, but the, the, I'm sure many of you, if you have children, will know about and the child and adolescent mental health services and how they're completely cash-strapped uh, and completely overwhelmed. And actually, you have to be inc extremely ill to get help. But I, I'm not going to talk about that because I could rant on about that for hours. Um, what, what I want to talk about is that how, how that um, uh, the OCD, as many of you, I'm sure, will be aware, drags your whole family uh, into uh, a complete nightmare, and that's what it did. And while we were doing that, and I was learning, as parents as you do, uh, learning overnight about OCD and about our son's OCD and how to navigate the system, uh, I was continuing my career in media, uh, and I, 
and I learnt uh, as a, through our, with our family and through our son. And I noticed how media was changing at around about the same time. And I, I don't think anybody can doubt that uh, mental illness and awareness of mental health in media has, uh, just over the last three years, has changed I I hugely. And one of, those, one of the reasons is the uh, Heads Together movement, which was sort of fronted by the, the royals, the, the three royals at the time, um, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge uh, and Prince Harry. Uh, and, uh, and that, uh, in media, has really helped change, um, change the awareness of, of mental, mental health. And I'm not just talking about what you see on air, but I'm talking about the meetings in newsrooms. I've been in newsrooms in, in say, the BBC, right the way through to much sort of uh, very different newsrooms, um, say, breakfast television, ITV, is sort of a lot more entertainment. And the conversations that are being had in those, those meetings um, sets the agenda for what goes on air. Uh, and I really notice a massive change when it comes to, to mental health. Uh, I mean, I remember when I started in the light, late 90s, you would, there were some newsrooms that were very much like the, the sort of stereoty stereotypical um, newspaper, 1970s newspaper newsroom, where you get some old bloke coming in, effing and blinding, saying, oh, that guy was a lunatic and he should be in a, an asylum and whatever. And actually, maybe one of those guests that he's talking about was actually struggling with a mental illness. That wouldn't happen now because that would be called out. So things are definitely changing for the better when it comes to mental health. When it comes to OCD, though, I would say um, it's very much uh, a few steps behind the, the general mental health, um, uh, the, the way the, the understanding of mental health is changing in media. Because I, I just don't think people understand it. People still think in media, um, that it, which it can be, it's washing hands and it's keeping things in order. But of course, we all know that OCD can be so much more than that. And it clearly was very different for my son. So I, I think... Um, I don't blame people for that because I think OCD is an incredibly complicated thing to understand. I'm still getting my head around it and I've lived with it with my son for, for many years. But I, I think that, I mean, the number of times someone has said, well, tell me about your son's OCD. And I've said, and this is in work, and I've said, um, well, it's not actually what you would expect, washing hands and keeping things in order. It's actually um, for extreme sexual thoughts. So, for example, if I'm, he was me and he was talking to you, he would be, and you can see the fear in their eyes. They don't want to be talking about this sort of stuff. And so I can understand that these are, these are strong, these are difficult subjects to deal with. But the understanding in media and the understanding in those newsrooms and documentary commissioning meetings and, uh, and, and many areas which dictates what goes on in media, um, those conversations, that understanding isn't quite there, and I, I think there's, a, there's an awful lot of work to be done. And I think that leads quite nicely on to uh, Rose, who will be coming up to talk in just a moment. I think she'll probably be here soon. Um, that uh, programs like Pure, if any of you saw it, were, were br brilliant dramas anyway, but they were incredibly educational to people who wouldn't really have a handle of what OCD is. Um, and it's quite shocking, and I, I've pointed a lot of people towards that program, but also given them a bit of a warning, you know, maybe don't watch it with your young kids. It, because OCD um, is a very complicated thing, and I still think there's a, a, an awfully long way to go in media. We've come a long way um, in the way we represent it and the way we understand it, but there is a, such a long way to go. Um, you've, you would have seen many of the OCD programs on television, and there's a very fine line between a program that tells very sympathetically the story of someone who is vulnerable and struggling with OCD and explains that story and tells people very well, and, and the fine line between that and someone who just, in a program that just mocks people who are struggling with a, a mental illness, and I, and I think there are still programs out there like that. Uh, one, one story that I had, I remember, I used to work with a very famous broadcaster who uh, regularly when we were on air, live on air, he, would, he, he liked to have things all in neat and, and I just had my scripts all over the place. And he would always joke that he was OCD and, uh, you know, that he was OCD because he liked to have everything in, in order and at home he, he cleaned up and all that sort of stuff. And then one day he heard a podcast that I did with uh, Bryony Gordon and with my son as well. Bryony Gordon, who writes for The Telegraph, who has OCD and has done some great work in, in raising awareness of, of the condition. And uh, we, it was right, right when my son was really struggling with his, with his OCD. He was in his school. Um, he, I think he was just about to go to hospital. He spent six months in hospital. And... Um, uh, he, he explained the OCD on the podcast, and this broadcaster heard the podcast, and after months of cracking jokes in front of the camera and behind the scenes about his OCD, he got in touch and said, I, I'm genuinely so sorry, I had no idea. I had no idea what OCD was. And I, I mean, this person is a very a good person, but they just didn't have the understanding, and I think sometimes it's easy to blame people for, for not having the understanding, 
um, they're good, maybe they're good people, but they just don't know. And he uh, has never done that since and never joked about that since. And I think it's, it's our place, my place, and people who are on television to try and change those attitudes and, uh, and encourage people to understand more about what it is. And I'll leave you with one story. I don't know if I'm sort of going on a bit because I'm conscious that Rose isn't here yet. Oh, you are here. Sorry, sorry, Rose. I was, I'm just uh, flannelling along so that you could, you could come. But I'll just leave you one, with one story. So social media, I think, can be very bad in many ways. Um, but there's a, a story, and I think, I think um, Ash is there now, I can see. A few people um, got in touch about a year ago to say that there was a... I, th I think I remember rightly that it was a, a crockery range that had a, a slogan on it that said something like, um, I'm pleased I've got OCD because I'm clean, or I love cleaning because I'm, o I'm OCD, or so something like that. J just something really stupid that you just don't expect to hear so much uh, nowadays. And um, a few of us on Twitter got in touch, and, and we tweeted about it. And the sort of movement, the, the sort of the, the interest that it generated meant that that crockery range disappeared. And I think that, was, that, that wouldn't have happened 10, 15 years ago because people would have said, it's only a joke, just get over it. But now we don't accept that sort of thing. And I think we, it shows we are going in the right direction. And, and one of the reasons we're going in the right direction is because of programs like Pure. So uh, I'll hand you over to Rose now. everyone good morning thank you Sean um, yeah I was here I was just late as usual like last year <laughs> I did exactly the same thing um, thank you to OCD action um, I've been working with these guys for several years now so they're quite used to my arch levels of disorganization um, the first time I worked with OCD Action was in 2013, and they asked me to uh, write a blog post about uh, my experiences of OCD. Um, and we've been supporting each other with various projects ever since. Um, so thank you especially to Olivia, who's just always amazing, and the whole team. Um, as Sean said, and as you may know, uh, I wrote a book called Pure about my life with OCD. And that book has now been made into a Channel 4 drama series also called Pure. Um, Pure became my, uh, my life's, my work for the past three years, five, six years of my life. Um, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about what it's like to um, work on such a big scale media project with OCD at its heart and some of the challenges that I faced given the um, media background that Sean's just described. Um, just a heads up to younger members of the audience and parents, some of the subject matter I touch on when I'm talking about pure is quite adult. Um, it's not gratuitousness. It's not gratuitous. I never, I never try to be gratuitous, but um, just by its very nature, um, some, some pretty grown-up stuff comes up. Um, it's frank. Um, and another heads up, anyone who experiences a similar obsessive theme to I, to, that I do might find uh, the content quite triggering. Um, but of course, we all know that um, avoiding triggers is not the best way to finding peace. So I just invite you to accept whatever doubt and discomfort comes up and know that I'll be doing the same. Um, working on a creative project like this has been, above anything, a phenomenal privilege. I can scarcely think of anything more vindicating than going down to set and seeing thoughts that were once so shameful that I kept them secret for more than a decade, acted out by actors on the street with a full uh, TV crew and a director, and um, doing cut scenes where the director's shouting out, okay, now we're gonna do an intrusive thought, and the people are getting undressed, and it's, yeah, it was, it was weird. It was, it, was, it, was, it was very therapeutic in a way that I never expected. Uh, very exposing, actually. Um, uh, sort of, it's a weird meta experience of being triggered by the rendition of my own triggering thoughts. Um, but it's been more than anything uh, a great sense of em empowerment for me. Um, and I just want to start just so if anyone hasn't seen the show, I just want to uh, play you the one minute trailer that we um, released in January this year, which I hope is on the next slide. Um, so Pure, the book, uh, was crowdfunded. When um, the book got optioned, which, is mean a, which means a production company like buys the rights to sell it to broadcasters for a set period of time, um, I met with the production company and um, 
as that's a strange experience because you, when I wrote the book, I never thought anyone would read it. I never thought anyone would be interested in it. Um, and I certainly didn't think that um, a broadcaster like Channel 4 would want to put it on TV. I'm thinking, like, what kind of show could this possibly be? Um, and I met with the production company, and my first line in the sand, this was at the end of 2015, was that, above anything, OCD needed to be treated responsibly. Um, and so I got it written into my contract um, that we needed a professional OCD consultant on board, um, mainly because I, I, as a sufferer, I didn't have the expertise to do that myself. I didn't want the weight of responsibility on my shoulders. That would have been irresponsible. Um, so we brought in the big guns and we got Professor David Veal on board as our professional consultant. Um, so thank you, uh, Professor. I'm sure you're in the room. We're, um, Professor Veal and I are doing a, a talk together later about intrusive sexual thoughts, if anyone's interested in coming to that. Um, and on that note, intrusive sexual thoughts, um, that sort of became the kind of the hook of the show. Um, there's this young woman who has intrusive sexual thoughts that she can't get out of her mind. And that was both a blessing and a curse um, because it got people interested. Um, you read that in the Radio Times, you're like, hmm, I wonder what that's about. Um, but obviously it could so easily have been salaciously misinterpreted and that's what I really, really didn't want. Um, so one thing that I tried to emphasise in the initial creative discussions with the team was that... Um, Doubt is such a huge part of OCD. It's actually not about intrusive sexual thoughts or intrusive violent thoughts. Um, it's about how agonised the central character, based on me, feels about what those thoughts mean. Um, and it's the lengths that she goes to to try and reach a sense of certainty that she can never reach. And I think that's a, that's a nuance that often gets left out of the picture when, when OCD is portrayed in the media. It's about the doubt and it's about the... The, the inability to, to feel a sense of security. Um, I came face to face with the media machine in a very literal way this year um, because we did a huge press junket around the show and I was doing some short, Sean will know when you're promoting a big project, you end up doing, you know, seven million interviews, talking to different journalists. And I really resonated when you said that you kind of, there's nothing that makes you feel more lonely than when you get the kind of the blank stare of, of, of total lack of comprehension from when you're saying something that's like so, you know, we, t we talk about some pretty, uh, some pretty gritty stuff and I talk about it as part of my job. So I, I guess I take it for granted that this is stuff that people get. And when you say, oh, yeah, I have, you know, violent, intrusive sexual thoughts like a thousand times a day, and, like, a journalist is just like, wow, like, not really not getting it, that's, um, that's quite a sobering moment. Um, it was quite challenging, uh, speaking about my story um, so often and in such depth. Um, in, on one particular occasion, I got asked to write a first-person piece for a national newspaper, and it was a really nice, open, flexible brief. It was like, tell us about where you are with your mental health, where you've come from, how you got here. And I wrote this piece that I was really pleased about, um, about my writing and my OCD and my meditation and self-love and feeling empowered. Um, and the editor came back and said, no, 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 we want a definition of OCD, a history of symptoms, and a description of your treatment. Um, and she sort of chopped up the piece so that it basically resembled a, a, a clinical definition that you'd read in a, a textbook. Um, and I remember feeling really unseen in that moment, like I was being told who I was, like I'd been reduced to a label. Um, and I think it as much as it's important to get a, a concise and clear definition of OCD out there, we also can't take OCD out of the context of people's lives. Um, I know that my feelings about myself change all the time. There's a lot more to OCD than intrusive sexual thoughts, um, and there's a lot more to me than my OCD, so I think we need to be careful to always see the whole person in these conversations, not just the label that we give them. Um, I said to the editor, let's just pull the piece, I don't want to do it. Um, and she came back to me and she said, oh, well, how about we edit it the way we want it, we write it, and then we put your name on it. Um, I was like, no, no, that's like li literally the worst idea. Um, and that sort of really highlighted for me a central problem um, when discussing mental health on, on big scale media platforms is like, it's really hard to preserve sufferer voices um, authentic voices, like us telling our experiences in our own words. Um, and um, 
that's why I had to stay close to the production process with Pure um, and Channel 4 took that really seriously. It was really important to them that um, there was a through line in the whole show and that was not just a definition of OCD, but what is my subjective experience of OCD? And I think that's really important. And also I think um, OCD Action do that really beautifully as well. They, they've always supported every individual's right to tell their own version of OCD rather than giving this monolithic definition of what it is. And I think that's really important. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the crowdfunding video. Um, when I went down the traditional publishing route, what I was told was that um, it was good, but there was no audience for it. Um, and I think that highlights a problem in OCD, and, in, and particularly in OCD that is purely obsessional, i.e. the compulsions are less overt, is that People don't really know that we're here because a lot of our behaviours are going on inside our heads. Um, and I felt really certain that, um, that there was an audience out there. It's just that we were hiding and we weren't talking about it. Um, so this is the point at which I would have showed you my crowdfunding video. But, oh, f**k. It's usually something, no. Okay. I'm Rose Bottiche and I'd like to talk to you about my new book, Pure. Have you ever had one of those really weird intrusive thoughts where you're just like, F where did that come from? Like something totally inappropriate and shocking. Imagining your boss naked or punching an old person in the street or jumping off a train platform. These are all really common intrusive thoughts that we all get sometimes, but most of you will be able to dismiss them really easily. Um, because deep down, you know that you don't really want to do those things. But what happens when the bit of your brain which allows you to dismiss those thoughts isn't working properly. What happens when you get those thoughts so regularly that they start to become a real challenge to your sense of self, that you start to doubt yourself? What happens when the bits of your brain which tell you who you are break down? That's what my book's about. A little bit. Um, so that's the lead protagonist is Charlie Clive, um, playing played. Um, playing Marnie, he's based on me, um, and in the first draft of the script, Marnie was called Rose, um, which I guess I should have predicted, given that it's based on a book written by me in the first person, um, and this weird thing happened where I had a kind of really visceral, like, no, bork reaction to seeing my name attached to that character, which I thought was quite interesting, um, and I think it was because it was such a big project where you send like thousands of emails and have like a thousand meetings, phone calls, annotations. After struggling with my identity for so long and sort of finally feeling that I owned it, um, I didn't want to see my name in inverted commas on a page or have to talk about Rose. Um, so that's why she ended up being called Marnie. Um, and it doesn't matter how many times I've seen the show or how many times I've talked about it, um, it's still kind of chokes me up often when I sort of sit down and watch it. I didn't watch it when it went live. That was I watched the first episode with all my friends and family and that was really exciting. But after that, I just kind of let it go. Um, and it's this weird experience of knowing that I've brought my friends and family as close as possible to my experience, um, the experiences that I hid for so long, um, but also feeling relieved that I'll always get to shield them from the actual reality. Um, because they'll never get inside here. And it's funny that that can feel like relief and loneliness at the same time. Um, I want to play you the uh, first scene of the show that aired um, when we went live, um, because it relates directly to my crowdfunding video that I made five years ago, um, because she speaks my words verbatim, which is the next. Um, I was very excited when that was on TV for the first time because going from um, making that first video five years ago in like a, a rundown studio uh, with a friend and sort of speaking those words down the barrel of a camera without ever expecting anyone would really see them to seeing it on national TV was just like, okay, well, um, it was liberating. I felt, okay, I, I don't have to be ashamed of this anymore. Um, I just want to close by telling you a little bit about the reception. Um, Channel 4 conducted a public value study after the show aired, um, and um, I'm really proud about what, what these statistics hint at, and I 
meant to put the statistics on the, on the slideshow, but I forgot, so I'm just going to read them to you. 86% um, of viewers felt that Pure provided a view of mental health they'd never seen on TV before. 80% of viewers claimed that the series made them realise that people should be just as sympathetic to mental health issues as any physical ailment. Um, and this last one, the one that means the most to me, as a direct consequence of watching Pure, over a quarter of viewers said they'd been motivated to talk to their friends or family specifically about the issues raised in the series. And 21% of young viewers said they'd been motivated to seek help from a professional since watching the series. Um, and I hope that just gives you a glimpse of why it's so important to take the time and do the due diligence and do the research and get the right people on board when we're talking about mental health on these big scale media projects. Um, I really hope it's been worth it and I hope it resonated with you and the community. Thank you very much. Thank you both very much indeed. Um, thank you. I, I don't think one can overestimate the importance of the media in the OCD fight. Uh, and part of that fight, uh, as you both indicated, is, is, is around the nuance of OCD. And it takes uh, brave and honest people like you to put your head above the parapet to, to, to make that case. So thank you both very much indeed. It's fantastic.